Hi everyone, good day. This is Dr. Vaughn. And for this week's discussion, we will be discussing about your introduction to electrolytes, water distribution, and as well as your osmolality. So we officially ended now your enzymology topic. And for the midterms and final, we will be discussing all about your electrolytes. For this week, we'll just be introducing about your electrolytes, the importance of water as well as the water distribution, and most importantly, your osmolality. I know that you are already familiar with your osmolality. For this uh, learning, for our learning objective for our video lecture, the students are able to discuss the importance of water, then determine the physiologic mechanisms in conserving your water, as well as the behavior of solutes in vivo. Then we will try to define your osmolality and osmolal gap and calculate its value. So water is said to be the solvent for all the processes in the body. Water constitute approximately 50 to 60% of your total body. Male has around 60% of total body water volume, while your female has approximately 50 to 55% of your total body water volume. Bakit doc mas marami ang sa lalaki compared sa babae in terms of total body water volume? It is because your man or male patients has more lean tissues compared to your female counterpart because this lean tissue, your muscles, and your solid organs have higher water content. Your female has more fat content which has lesser water content. That is why mas marami ang water content ng lalaki compared sa babae. So your total body water volume is approximately 60% of the body weight depending on the gender and the physical attributes of the patient. It is further subdivided into intracellular fluid volume and extracellular fluid volume. Pag sinabing intracellular, meaning nasa loob ng cells ang fluid. Pag sinabing extracellular, meaning nasa labas ng cells ang fluid. Intracellular is approximately 40% of the body weight or around 25 liters. Your extracellular fluid volume is further subdivided into two. It could be your interstitial fluid or within your plasma volume. Ang interstitial fluid volume is around 80% of your extracellular fluid, while your plasma volume is approximately 20% of your extracellular fluid. So we have this wonderful diagram to compare the body water content of a male, male and a female patient. So Female patient, around 45% solid and 55% fluid. While sa male, 40% solid, 60% fluid. Mas marami kasing muscle tissue compared sa babae na which has more fat content. Again, total body fluid, two-thirds is from your intracellular fluid. And one-third is from your extracellular fluid. Your extracellular fluid is further subdivided. Interstitium. This is your interstitium outside the cell and your plasma within your blood capillaries. So around 80% ang IF, 20% ang ating plasma. Meron din tayong tinatawag na daily maintenance fluid requirement. Ito yung pagkukumpute natin ng daily fluid requirement ng, at, ng bawat isa. So meron tayong kanya-kanyang maintenance fluid requirement depending on the body weight of our patient. So this is the formula that we usually use. For the first 10 kilogram, ang kailangan ng fluid volume is around 100 ml per kilogram or around 4 ml per kilogram per hour. So pas easier to compute na per day na lang. Again, for the first 10 kilogram ng pasyente, kailangan sa bawat kilogram ng first 10 kilogram, kailangan natin ng 100 ml of fluid. So in short, for example, pasyente natin is a baby. 3 kilogram ang ating pasyente. So first 10 kilogram, 3 kilos ating pasyente. 3 kilos times 100 is equal to 300 kilograms. So the body fluid uh, requirement for our patient is around 300. For the next 10 to 20 kilogram, bawat kilogram kailangan ng 50 ml. Pag umabot na ito ng around 11 to 20 kilograms. So this is wrong. This should be 11 to 20. Ha? Take note of that. Should be 11 to 20. Kasi nga, ito, first 10. Next 10, from 11 to 20, kung nakaabot ng 11 to 20, bawat kilogram is around 
50 ml ang kailangan. Kung umabot ang pasyente, kung ang timbang ng pasyente is more than 20 kg, bawat kilo ay kailangan ng 20 ml of fluid. So kung ang pasyente natin umabot ng 25, so yung excess na 5 kg, imumultiply lang natin sa 20, so yan yung excess na kailangan natin para sa daily maintenance fluid requirement. Paano ba natin kinukumpute yan? For example, patient came in, a 45 kg man, what will be the daily maintenance fluid requirement for our patient? For the first 10 kg, ano nga sabi natin? For the first 10 kg, bawat kilogram kailangan natin ng 100 ml. So, 100 ml sa bawat kilogram for the first 10 kilogram. Since ang ating patient is 45, nakaabot siya ng 10 kilogram sa first 10. So, 10 times 100 will be 1,000 liter. For the next 10 kilogram, dapat kailangan ng 50 ml fluid. So, again, nakaabot naman ng 20 kilogram ang ating patient. So, 10 times 50 equals 500 liters. Now, for the excess kilogram, sa bawat excess ng kilogram, kailangan lang natin i-multiply sa 20. Sa 20. So, 20 times 25. Kasi nga, 45 minus 20, first 10, tapos next 10. 10 plus 10, that's your 20. So, i-compute natin ang excess. 45 minus 20, nagiging 25. And bawat excess na kilogram, i-multiply lang sa 20. 25 times 20, that's gonna be 500. So, 1,500 plus 500, that's a total of 2,000 liter. So, a 45 kilogram man needs 2,000 liter as a daily maintenance fluid requirement. So, ganyan natin sinusolve ang kailangan fluid na kailangan ng ating pasyente. Yung nagra-rounds ako every time, nung, since medtech pa lang ako, I was really curious kung paano ba kinukumpute ng mga nurses or ng mga doktor yung, yung IV fluid na binibigay sa pasyente. So, for the patient lang pala na walang diarrhea, walang vomiting, ang kinukumpute lang talaga namin is using your holiday, holiday cigar method. Kung walang fluid loss, walang vomiting, walang diarrhea, normal maintenance fluid lang ang kailangan, ito lang yung pag-compute namin. So, ang ginagawa namin, for example, 45 man, kailangan siya ng 2,000 liter na daily fluid intake. So, ang ginagawa namin, 2,000 divided by 24, that's gonna be around blah, blah, blah. So, ML per R, yan yung binibigay namin na fluid. So, nire-regulate lang namin. So, yan lang pala pagpasolve ng ating daily maintenance fluid. Pero iba na pag meron na tayong mga fluid loss, pwede na kaming magdagdag. Ng, pwede namin gawing 30 cc per kilogram, tapos idagdag namin sa daily maintenance fluid. But for our discussion, I just want you to learn the daily maintenance fluid requirement. Just remember this. Again, for the first 10, 100. For the next 10, 50, and for the very excess kilogram, only 20, then you add that, that's gonna be your maintenance fluid requirement. If I'm asked, if I ask you what would be the maintenance fluid requirement per hour, simply divide lang 2,000 divided by 24. So water distribution is controlled by electrolytes and protein. Because most biologic membranes are freely permeable to water but not to ions or proteins, the concentration of ions and proteins on either side of your membrane will influence the flow of water across a membrane, an osmoregulator. Remember the osmotic effect of your sodium? Ano ngang dictum natin dyan? Where sodium goes, water follows. So, not only sodium but also your albumin. Kaya nga, Diba may patient tayo na nagkakaroon ng igima pag mababa ang serum albumin? Bakit kaya? Pag mababa ang serum albumin sa ating dugo, anong nangyari? Water will escape from your blood vessel and goes to different third spaces. Pupunta siya sa ating interstitial fluid at magkakaroon ng igima ang ating pasyente kasi mababa ang protein. Action ng protein, it's an osmoregulator or os have an osmotic effect. Meaning, inaabsorb niya yung tubig. Pero pag wala ng albumin, lumalabas ang tubig, kaya nagkakaroon ng edema. Concentrations of ion for both your intra and extracellular, it is actually maintained by active transport. It requires energy to move ions across cellular membranes. Example, ATPase-dependent sodium-potassium ion pumps. 
active transport clue natin, it requires energy. That's the best way to differentiate active transport from your, excuse me, from your passive transport. For diffusion or your passive transport, passive movement of ions across a membrane, it is dependent on the size and charge of ion, may be altered by physiologic and hormonal processes. So again, paano natin madidifferentiate ang active sa passive? Active needs energy. Passive, walang energy ang kailangan para to move your, your ions. So this is a very nice table for us to compare the different types of transport mechanism using your active, your passive, and active transport mechanism. And this will be, this diagram will give us a overview of what happens with this different transport mechanism. So again, define muna natin types. Ano mga types ng ating transport mechanism? Two main types. We have your passive and active. Yung passive, that's gonna be your simple and facilitated. We have your active, that's gonna be your primary active transport, and your secondary active transport. Ano yung mga secondary active transport natin? You have your co-transport and your counter-transport. Ano itong ibig sabihin po, Doc, ng electrochemical gradient? Pag sinabing downhill, it is the movement of your solute from a higher concentration to a lower concentration. Tingnan natin, from a higher concentration, pupunta siya sa lower concentration. That's downhill. Pag sinabing uphill, from a low concentration to a higher concentration. Tingnan nyo, from a low concentration to a higher concentration. It's just basically the opposite of your downhill. Carrier mediated, anong ibig sabihin ng carrier mediated? It uses your carrier protein. So, gumagamit siya ng carrier proteins para mapasok or mapalabas ang certain ions. Metabolic energy, kakailangan ba natin ng energy or hindi? Next, sodium gradient. Sodium gradient, kung Anong energy ang ginagamit niya? Gumagamit ba siya ng sodium gradient para mapalabas or mapasok ang certain ion? Okay, let's start with simple diffusion. Simple diffusion. Remember, your simple diffusion and your facilitated diffusion is an example of a, of a passive diffusion. Kasi nga, anong pina-remember uh, pina ko sa inyo? Ang passive diffusion, walang energy. Metabolic energy, wala. No, no. So, hindi gumagamit ng energy. Tingnan natin, simple diffusion and facilitated diffusion. So what uh, differentiate your simple diffusion from their facilitated diffusion is that your facilitated diffusion uses a carrier mediated protein. Tingnan nyo, your facilitated diffusion uses a carrier mediated protein. However, your simple and your facilitated diffusion does not requires energy and it is a Downhill requirement. Ano ang downhill requirement? Simple lang, Doc. Downhill meaning from a higher concentration to a lower concentration. That's downhill. Very simple. Sodium gradient? No. No, hindi siya gumagamit ng sodium gradient kasi nga, hindi naman siya gumagamit ng energy. Next, let's proceed from a primary active transport versus your secondary active transport which is your co-transport and your counter transport your primary active transport is an uphill meaning from a low concentration ito active transport ito ha number 1 from a low concentration to a higher concentration that is a up uphill and it consumes your energy kumbaga yung solute sinisiksik niya yung sarili niya dito sinisiksik niya yung sarili niya sa kanya so parang parang for that to happen, kailangan niya ng energy. So, siksik mo ang sarili mo sa kanya. Pero di ba, ayaw natin isiksik yung ating sarili sa kanya. Kasi nga, in reality, pag sinisik natin ang sarili natin sa isang taong hindi naman tayo love, it will consume a lot of time and energy and we don't want that. So, we don't want your uphill. Ang gusto natin is yung downhill. Kasi yung downhill, kahit hindi ka na kailangan mag-effort, wala ng time, alam mong darating siya. Ay, wali. In short, basta yun lang remember nyo ha, pag uphill, you need energy, parang isisiksik mo yung sarili mo, kahit puno na, kahit marami na, kahit ayaw nyo na, kahit nasosobra na siya, tama na, pero 
because this is a uphill and you need an energy. Again, your primary active uses an uphill uh, electrochemical reagent, uh, gradient rather, including your secondary mechanism, your co-transport and your co-transport. Again, your, your primary and your secondary, it all uses your carrier-mediated. So, gumagamit siya ng carrier-mediated protein. Next, metabolic energy. Again, since kailangan niya isiksik ang sarili niya sa isang tao, kailangan niya ng effort, kailangan niya ng energy and time, which we do not like. Pero sa secondary transport mechanism, it's indirect. Ang kailangan niya is your sodium gradient. Sodium gradient ang magpapapasok sa ating mga ayon. So, kailangan niya ng sodium gradient. Ang sodium gradient ang magbibigay ng energy para sa co-transport and counter-transport para mangyari ang active transport. So, sodium gradient sa co-transport, sodium gradient sa counter-transport. Pag sinabing co-transport, same direction. Among, anong ibig sabihin niyan, Dok? Yung co-transport, for example, your sodium calcium co-transport, papasok ang sodium dito, papasok din yung calcium. Kasi nga, it's a co-transport using your sodium gradient as your energy. How about your counter-transport po, Dok? Opposite direction, meaning example, your sodium hydrogen pump or sodium hydrogen. Your sodium goes in, your hydrogen hydrogen goes out. So, it's an opposite direction. So, yes, it uses your sodium gradient. I guess it's very simple. And if you have any question with regard regarding this topic, you can just simply PM me. So, let's give some example of your, your different transport mechanism. Simple diffusion, example natin dyan, your oxygen and your carbon dioxide. Remember, oxygen, kailangan ng ating katawan ang oxygen. So, dapat, diretso makapasok lang sa ating katawan. It doesn't require any energy or any carrier-mediated protein. How about your facilitated diffusion? Example ng facilitated diffusion is your mga glute transporter or your glucose transporter. Marami tayong glucose transporter sa ating katawan. Meron tayong glucose transporter sa ating brain, sa ating small intestine, sa ating kidney. Next, primary active transport. Anong example yan? Lahat, again, lahat ng may ATPA sa pangalan, it is a primary active transport. Lahat ng walang ATPA na pangalan, pero may sodium, it's co-transport or your co-counter-transport. It could be a secondary active. Again, lahat ng may pangalang ATPA, example, your sodium, potassium, ATPA, that is a primary active transport. How about your secondary active transport? Lahat ng may sodium pero walang ATPs, that's a secondary active transport. I guess I remembered na parang ni-lecture ko to sa inyo, right? Ganyan lang yan para maalala nyo. Example ng co-transport natin, ano yung sinabi ko? Your sodium calcium co-transport. Your counter-transport, your sodium hydrogen counter-transport. So, may sodium sa pangalan, pero walang ATPase. Ang primary, merong ATPase. So, osmolality, yes, this is very familiar with you guys, right? Your osmolality is a physical property of a solution that is based on the concentration of solute. It is expressed as millimoles or per kilogram of solvent versus your osmolarity, weight over volume. Again, di ba sabi ko, in a clinical setup, mas prefer natin yung osmolality na term. Kasi nga, your osmolarity will be inaccurate in cases of hyperlipidemia, hyperproteinemia, and for PA4, those using your urine specimen, as well as those with the presence of osmotically active substances such as your alcohol and mannitol. So, if we have dehydration, what will be the mechanism or of our body for it to go nor, uh, to, to back to a physiologic function. Again, dehydration. Anong mga triggers natin dyan? Pwedeng magkaroon ng decreased flow of saliva or increased blood osmolarity or decreased blood volume. Pag meron tayong decreased flow of saliva, ano nangyayari? There will be dry, drying of mouth and your pharynx. Then that will stimulate your thirst center in your hypothalamus. How about increased blood osmolarity? It will stimulate your osmoreceptors in your hypothalamus, which will stimulate your 
thirst center in your hypothalamus. Again, increases your thirst. Pag decrease ang volume, anong nangyayari? Ang blood volume, bababa din ang blood pressure. Pag mababa ang blood pressure, madidetect ng ating kidney to secret now your renin from your just two glomerular cells. Remember this renin? This will cause now an increase in your angiotensin II formation, thereby can cause the stimulation of your hypothalamus. There will be increase in thirst and increases water intake so that you will able to maintain the normal water content for our body. How about this one? I guess this is a very familiar diagram, right? Yung naalala yung discussion natin sa antidiuretic hormone, your high plasma osmolarity and low plasma osmolarity. Okay, review lang natin ng madalian. Very familiar na to sa inyo. Pag low effective circulating volume, pag mataas ang ating plasma osmolarity, meaning mababa ang tubig sa ating katawan kasi tumataas ang asin sa katawan. Nagiging, ano nangyayari? Nag thirst increases. Tataas din ang ating antidiuretic hormone release kasi nga kailangan natin ng mag-conserve ng water. Water is ingested and there will be increased water reabsorption. Then water is retained and there will be normal plasma osmolarity. How about pag malabnaw ang ating plasma osmolarity or masyadong maraming tubig, pababaan ang ating thirst and pababaan ang release ng ating, excuse me, antidiuretic hormone. Because hindi natin kailangan makonserve ng water kasi nga masyadong maraming tubig. Idi-decrease ang water reabsorption, there will be water loss, thereby going back to a normal plasma osmolarity. So this is a very simple regulation of water inside the body. So osmolality clinical significance, the normal plasma osmolality is around 275 to 295 milliosmoles per kilogram of plasma water. Your osmoreceptors respond to small changes and again, this is regulated by antidiuretic hormone or your arginine, vasopressin, and your thirst. So a 1% to a 1 to 2% increase in your osmolality causes a four fold increase in the circulation of your AVP while a 1 to 2% decrease naman ng ating osmolality shuts off your ADH production. Again, clinical significance Water load and water deficit. Review lang natin. Alam na natin to. Water load, meaning masyadong maraming tubig. Anong nangyayari sa plasma osmolarity? Increase or decrease? So, please try to answer because this is the only way for you to determine na meron ba talagang na-retain sa ating previous discussion. Again, water load. Masyadong maraming tubig sa ating katawan. Anong mangyayari sa ating plasma osmolarity? Increase or decrease? Of course, nagiging decrease kasi nga nagiging malabnaw, maraming masyadong tubig. So with that, your ADH will be increased or decreased. Masyadong maraming tubig na, kailangan pa ba natin ma na mag-conserve ng water? Of course, hindi na. In short, your ADH will be decreased. How about your urine osmolarity? Increase or decrease? Urine osmolarity, masyadong maraming tubig. In short, yung tubig pinapalabas natin ang tubig, nagiging malabnaw ang ating ihi. Since nagiging malabnaw ang ating ihi, ang urine osmolarity, buma, baba. So, urine osmolarity decreases. How about your water deficit? Your plasma osmolarity? Again, this urine osmolarity refers now to the action of your ADH na ha? So, your water deficit, plasma osmolarity, increase or decrease plasma osmolarity, hindi ka uminom ng tubig. Walang tubig, lalong tumataas ang asin sa ating katawan, kaya your plasma osmolarity increases. How about your ADH? Since mataas ang plasma osmolarity, kailangan ba nating mag-conserve ng water? Of course, kasi nga walang tubig, water deficit. So your ADH will be increased. Since with the action of your antidiuretic hormone, what will be the effect to the urine osmolarity? Increase or decrease with the effect na to sa ating ADH ha? Pag may effect na ang ADH, what will happen to your osmolarity? Since your antidiuretic hormone is being increased, your urine osmolarity will also be increased. Kasi nga, lalong kinoconserve natin yung antidiuretic. Kasi yung ADH, kinoconserve natin yung water. Since walang tubig na pumapasok sa ating urine, nagiging 
concentrated ang urine, kaya nag-i-increase. So, these diagrams, check nyo to sa inyong bishop, nandun nyo sa bishop na part, responses to the changes in your blood osmolality and your blood volume. So, there are three scenarios that will have an effect to your blood osmolality and your blood volume. So, what will be the mechanism or physiologic action of our body? If hyperosmolarity or hypernatremia, remember, masyadong maraming asin. In short, mababa ang tubig sa ating katawan. Ano mangyayari? It will stimulate your brain. Pafollow nyo lang araw guys ha, isi-stimulate ang ating brain to secrete your antidiuretic hormone. Anong action ng ating antidiuretic hormone? Simply to, sorry, simply to retain your water. How about hypovolemia? Meaning, mababa ang fluid volume sa ating katawan. Anong effect sa ating katawan? Anong mangyayari? It will, again, follow the arrow, stimulate the brain. It will stimulate the brain to have thirst. This will be now sa thirst center sa ating katawan para tumaas ang tubig sa ating katawan. What else? Since my hypovolemia, ang nangyayari, mababa din ang renal perfusion pressure sa ating kidney. Pag mababa ang renal perfusion pressure sa ating kidney, nare-release ang ating renin. Ang renin, ang nung trabaho ng ating renin, renin is a hormone that catalyzes the reaction of your angiotensinogen into your angiotensin 1. Your angiotensinogen from the liver will be converted into your angiotensin 1 because of your renin. Your angiotensin 1 will be converted by your ACE from the liver becoming your angiotensin 2. Your angiotensin 2 will cause vasoconstriction to increase your blood pressure. And also, it will stimulate your adrenal gland to secrete your aldosterone. Ano nga ang action ng aldosterone? Increased sodium, decreased potassium. Sodium, retention, potassium, excretion. Ano nga ang dictum natin? Where sodium goes, water follows. And therefore, there will be water retention. No, this is very familiar with you guys. It's very easy on your part already. I know, madali na lang to sa inyo. Just simply follow the diagram, alright? Ay, next, meron pa tayong isa. Meron pa tayong hypervolemia. Ano namang hypervolemia? Opposite naman dito. Kasi nga, ang hypervolemia, masyado namang maraming tubig sa ating katawan. Anong nangyayari? Nagiging congested ang ating katawan. You can have lung congestion or you can have fluid overload sa ating puso. So, pag nagkakaroon ng fluid overload sa ating puso, it will signal the heart to secrete your ANP. Your ANP is secreted by the heart, by your cardio, by your myocyte, cardiac myocyte, to secrete your atrial natriuretic peptide. Your ANP will cause renal sodium and water excretion. So, tinatanggal ang ating tubig sa ating puso para ma-neutralize ma ang hypervolemia. Alright? So, these are the summary of factors that maintains the body water balance. Diniscuss na natin ito kanina. Your hypothyroid center ng ating hypothalamus, your angiotensin 2, aldosterone, your ANP, and your antidiuretic hormone. So, again, it's easier na you go back again with your diagram kasi nga, malalaman na natin yung mechanism as well as its own effect. So, no need to discuss this one. Perfect na natin yan. So, let's proceed with your urine osmolality. Your urine osmolality vary widely depending on the water intake and collection of your, circo of your cir collection circumstances. Decreased in diabetes insipidus or polydipsia. Remember with our discussion this one? Diabetes insipidus and polydipsia, meaning you are secreting too much water. Therefore, nagiging malabnaw ang ating ihi. That's why it's a decrease in urine osmolarity. Increased in urine osmolarity, example, SIADH and your hypovolemia. Hypovolemia kasi nagko-conserve tayo ng water. Ayaw natin palabasin ang water kaya nagiging concentrated ang urine. Tumataas ang urine osmolality. How about SIADH? Syndrome inappropriate antidiuretic hormone. Therefore, there is an increased level of your antidiuretic hormone. If there is an increased level of your antidiuretic hormone, therefore, nagko-conserve ka ng water. Ayaw mong palabasin ng tubig. Therefore, lalong nagiging concentrated ang hihi 
increased urine osmolarity. Perfect na natin yan. So, for the determination of your urine osmolality, meron tayong ginagamit na machine for that. So, ang ating sample na ginagamit is your urine or serum. How about plasma? Bakit natin hindi ginagamit ang plasma? Kasi plasma use is not recommended for the determination of your osmolality because it has active substances na nandun sa ating anticoagulant. Kasi nga, meron siyang mga osmotic substances na nasa ating anticoagulant making our result false. So, we detect our sodium, chloride, and your bicarbonate. The major electrolyte concentration, based on the colligative properties of solution, changes in the freezing point and your vapor pressure. So, the freezing point, remember freezing point, this will be the principle that we'll be going to use para madetect ang ating osmolality sa machine. Turbid specimen must be centrifuged to remove extraneous particles. Ito na yung tinatawag natin na machine na ginagamit para ma-determine yung ating osmolality. We have your osmometers. This is your osmometer. So, in my years of experience, never pa ako nakakita nito. Never din ako nag-encounter na nag-request ako ng plasma osmolality or mga nagpa-request ng plasma osmolality or serum osmolality. I don't know. So, this is your osmometers. Again, your osmometers follows the principle of a freezing point depression. So, we collect our sample. Ano nga yung sample natin? Serum and your urine, but never plasma. Your serum or fluid, collect tayo ng sample, ilalagay sa cuvette, papasok sa ating machine. And then, it will be cooled, super cooled, around negative 7 degrees Celsius. As far as I remember, negative 7. Can you check in your bishop if negative 7 ba yun? And then, after that, we will be collecting now the result here. Lalabas yung result and we will record it. So what is the importance, Doc, of doing a calculation of your osmolality? Doc, bakit natin kinukumpute yung osmolality? The importance of, of doing a calculation of your osmolality is to estimate the true osmolality. At least, meron tayong estimation sa ating katawan. Or, it is useful for the determination of your osmolal gap. We have to compute for osmolality for us to compute for our, excuse me, sorry, osmolal gap. So what is osmolal gap? Your osmolal gap is the difference between the measured osmolality and calculated osmolality. Indirectly indicates the presence of osmotically active substances other than your sodium, urea, or glucose. In short, hindi lang dinedetect niya yung sodium, urea, glucose, but ang dinedetect niya mainly is your ethanol, methanol, ethylene glycol, lactate, and your beta hydroxybutyrate. Again, paano kinun detect measured osmolality, subtract to your calculated osmolality. Measured minus calculated osmolality, that's gonna be your osmolal gap. Anong importance ng ating osmolal gap? To detect your ethanol, methanol, ethylene glycol, and these other substances. Kasi nga, your osmolal gap has a good clinical significance in those patients who have a suspected Toxic ingestion. Kasi nga, madedetect natin if whether may ethanol, methanol, toxic ingestion ang pasyente. Now, paano ba natin minimeasure yung kinakalculate yung osmolality? Since alam na natin paano makompute ang osmolal gap, dapat malaman din natin paano makompute yung osmolality. So, may dalawang formula com comes from the book. This one and this one. So, According to certain books, may advantage itong unang formula. Some books would say may, may advantage din naman itong nung second na formula. But for the, form, uh, for the uniformity of everyone, we will follow this formula, okay? Follow natin to for our quiz purposes para uniform ang ating calculation. Kasi nga, same lang pa rin yan. Pero para, para form, uh, uniform tayo, gagamitin natin itong first formula sa ating sa ating exam, okay? Expect na we will have calculations sa ating exam. So, prepare a calculator during our exam. Simple lang, we will not give an example kasi nga simple lang. You have a sodium, given naman yung sodium, ibibigay ko na yan, imumultiply lang ng 2. Bibigay ko yung glucose in milligrams per DL, i-divide sa 20. Yung BUN in milligrams per DL, i-divide lang ng 3. So, then you add, then that's gonna be your calculated osmolality. And then, I will ask you to compute for your osmolal gap. 
Ano nga yung osmolalga formula? Measured osmolality. Ito yung measured osmolality sa ating sa ating machine. So ibibigay ko na yan. Isasubtract mo lang sa calculated osmolality. So your calculated osmolality, we use this formula, okay? And then you'll be able to detect your osmolal gap. And the most important reference range to memorize is your serum osmolality and your osmolal gap. Ito lang dalawa and including your urine. Serum, urine, and your osmolal gap. Remember the the reference range because I must ask if whether nasa normal range ba to higher or lower values. Yes, that ends our discussion. Very short lang kasi nga, it's just a review of what we discussed previously sa ating antidiuretic hormone and your osmolality. So, God bless everyone. Good luck with our quiz next week and happy aral. Thank you guys.